order with everybody. So we're going to, uh, I'll be using the a PowerPoint presentation and then sometimes refer to the guide as well. And yes, so today is the last day of legal ethics. Tomorrow we will be continuing with constitutional law practice. Um, I'm going to share my screen and then we can get started. Again, if it's in order with everybody, we'll just take a short break, uh, maybe just a 10 minute refresher, or, uh, you know, uh, you know, throughout shorter breaks uh, rather than a long break. And then we try to finish um, a bit earlier if that is in order with everybody. I'm going to share my screen and just please let me know if you can see when I am sharing. Can you see? Yes, yes it's all right. Okay. Yes, we can. Perfect. And again, um, you know, as I'm sharing my screen, I can't see my chat. So if you've got any questions or queries, just please feel free to interject. So we pick up where we left, um, where we left yesterday evening, and just um, I haven't sent the slides yet to Zukiswa. I just made a couple of changes to them as well, and I added um, some links here and there for you. There was a lot of questions yesterday pertaining to um, admissions, etc. And I just put, uh, well, I found this pretty useful. Um, and I'm also just quickly going to share the site with you in terms of what you should. Um, let me just first get it in, in presentation mode. Um, the site in terms of admission and exactly what is required of you in terms of admission. So the uh, Javi Leroux site is very useful. It is also, I know that he offers a lot of practical uh, training courses as well in terms of preparing yourself for admission. But what I have found useful here is um, the requirements in terms of what is necessary for your admission papers themselves. You see there, he says exactly the notice of motion. Um, the founding affidavit. So what's very nice of this is it goes rule by rule. So it tells you exactly what is required for you of you in terms of your admission papers. And then what I found specifically um, relevant in terms of our discussion yesterday is the bit that says a declaration about fitness and properness. So apart from of your founding affidavit, you must obviously declare that you are a fit and proper person for admission as an attorney, as a legal practitioner. So confirmation that uh, the applicant has not previously been admitted as an advocate of, or an attorney of any court. Confirmation of no previous criminal convictions and no criminal investigations that's pending. Confirmation of no previous civil judgments or, and no civil proceedings pending and also confirmation of no previous disciplinary actions by the law society or a university if you or if you have a, a previous employer or even pending and this these facts should be disclosed to the court if there are any of the above allegations against the applicant uh, application a confirmation that the applicant's estate has not been sequestrated and there is no application for sequestration pending and obviously that the relevant prescribed fees, et cetera, has been paid. So that is basically the confirmation, what that confirmation should contain in relation to uh, about the relevant fitness and proper, uh, you know, fitness and proper um, to declare, your, to be able to be declared as a fit and proper individual. Um, let me just close and then I'm just quickly going to show you. Also, as I've mentioned yesterday, um, the LSSA is a very uh, has got very useful information, and you must also go and have a look and play around on their site. I've also got reference here to the LSSA uh, information in relation to to admissions. So please feel free when you've got some time to play around with their website, and um, you know uh, you know the information that they do provide you that is very relevant. So they've got their links to all the rules and the relevant act, and you know also give you some information in relation to what is necessary necess uh, necessary in terms of getting admitted as an attorney. So please make use of these sites and some of these information to provide yourself with more information in relating to admission. So I hope that answers some of the questions 
um, that that came up yesterday in relation to admissions and what is required of you. So especially what I've liked, liked about the Javi LaRue site is the fact that it shows you rule by rule what you should be putting into your affidavit, into your founding affidavit, and what you should be declaring in relation to, to being a fit and proper person. So obviously, if there is any information, you declare that to the court if there's any previous convictions, and it is for the court to decide then whether you would be declared um, a fit and proper to practice. So I'm going to move on now to the... Um, we will be starting today, so I've added those links for you if you'd like to have a look. And yesterday, we were Hello, busy. In yes. Uh, just one question. I think uh, you said you're going to get back to us today. Are we automatically registered as uh, candidate legal practitioners, or is a process that we have to follow? Uh, in terms of a, ca a candidate attorney? A candidate legal practitioner. I believe as, uh, 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 once we uh, enrolled uh, to do the pro uh, pro uh, this vocational training, the six months, uh, we can be, um, we are known as candidate legal pro uh, uh, practitioners. Is that correct? My understanding, candidate legal practitioner, my understanding is that it would be when you register for your uh, articles of clerkship. My apologies, I have completely forgot to follow up on that, but obviously I'm here with you tomorrow as well, so we can just have a look at the rules in relation to that. But obviously you are able to, to, to still register for your boards, but as to be known as the candidate attorney, obviously you need to be, um, you, ha you need to have a registered candidate, you know, you need to be registered as a candidate attorney in terms of doing your articles. But this is, uh, 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 this is one year articles, this six month course. So if it's six months article, if it's a one, if the six months training is equivalent to a year's articles, uh, won't that, won't you be, be a, 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 a candidate legal practitioner as well? I'm not exactly sure what the exact uh, the prescriptions of the regulations say, say. So if anybody's got information pertaining to that, but my Sorry, understanding can is... I, can I answer? Yes, please do. Um, so the six-month course that we're doing now qualifies us to um, register for a year of articles. So after the six-month course is completed, you can then register for uh, your articles, but that means that your article will be cut short by a year. So you won't have to do the two four years. The the six month course is merely um, to exempt you from doing the two years. So right now we're not registered candidate attorneys because we have to be registered under a principal. That's my yes. understanding. That's my understanding as well. So you're only you will be only uh, considered a candidate attorney if you've got a registered candidate candidate attorneyship contract with with a rele relevant principal. That is that is correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Um. So yes. To, yes. Sorry. Um. You are able to register for your articles while you are doing this course. Um, so you don't have to finish the course first um, to qualify you to to register your articles. You, yes, can, you can do it yes, while that's correct. You, while you're doing your your course, um, and your um, your year starts counting from the day that you signed the contract, but it must obviously be registered. Yes. So um, yes, I signed mine last year. Um, on the 20th of December, which means the 20th of December, end of this year, it would have been my year. But obviously you register initially for two years, but once you get your certificate of this course, and yes. then you apply at the LPC for them to reduce it to one year. Yeah, that is that is correct. But yes, you're regarded as a candidate attorney if you've registered a candidate attorney contract. Um, and if you're not, and not necessarily because you're registered for this course. Um, so yesterday we dealt with ethical, um, the ethical requirements and your responsibilities of ethical requirements in relation to your client. And today we'll be uh, continuing uh, with that specific aspect in relation to the client. So and yes. So, 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 sorry about this, Prof. I'm, I'm, I'm now worried when you are saying that the class continued yesterday, whereas I logged on 
around half past five, but there was nothing up until I logged off at seven. So, but there was nothing going on there. So now I think it was just the six of us, if I'm not mistaken, because I was busy testing my my device when I was hearing nothing going on. So now I'm starting to begin to be worried when you say when we are saying the class continued yesterday. Yes, we had the class yesterday, and most uh, most of the individuals attended. The class ran from half past half past five, your normal time, until just after eight. I think ten, ten past eight. So the class, uh, there was a class that was presented. I'm not too sure if you logged into the correct uh, to into the correct class. Maybe you should clear that up with uh, Zukiswa. But the, there definitely was a class, and there definitely was people attending until um, you know normal time. Um, eight, what is it? 17:30 until we just we we stopped the class just past eight. Uh, no, okay, no, it's fine because there was a lady I, sp I spoke to as well. She was uh, logged on as well. Then we, we, we were waiting with her also. I think it was just the six of us, if I'm not mistaken. So that's why yes. I'm saying I, I, I logged off at half past five up until uh, seven o'clock. So hearing that there was nothing happening, then I decided to, 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 to log off. So, yes, but, you, you but, might have been. You might have followed the incorrect link. Uh, I'm not exactly too, sh too sure, but just please follow up with Zukiswa. But there definitely was a class, um, a class yesterday, and we are continuing where we left off uh, yesterday evening. All right, thanks, Prof. It's a pleasure. So today we're we're continuing with a very important part. Um, and as I've mentioned before, we are following the, the, the guide pretty closely in terms of these presentations, and that is costs and fees. So very important in relation to costs and fees is when you receive your instructions from a client, um, you have to provide the client with a written cost estimate. And what should this written cost estimate include? So obviously the financial implications, any fees or charges, what the advocate uh, attorneys or advocates hourly fee is, and obviously the right to negotiate fees, the outline of the work to be done in respect of each stage, the likelihood of engaging an advocate um, uh, in the matter, and obviously their fees, and if it's an hourly rate, whatever the case might be, legal and financial consequences if you withdraw from a matter or litigation and what the, your or what the, your cost recovery regime is you also have to take notice of the contingent contingency fees act that's applicable and also you need to explain how legal costs work to your client especially in terms of when litigation is undertaken uh, and we know uh, the rule that costs follow suit in most litigation um, and your client should understand what the difference is between party and party costs. So we know that's costs that have been, been incurred by a party to legal proceedings that the other party is ordered to pay. We know not all costs that might have been incurred, it's only those that appeared to, uh, appear to the taxing master to have been necessary and proper for enforcing or defending rights. Attorney and client costs. So you might not only, if you unfortunately if you lose a case, that you might not be only resp responsible for your party and party costs, but also attorney client costs. An attorney is entitled to recover for professional services rendered. These are payable by the client, whatever the outcome of the case, and it's not a, a dependent upon a costs award by a court. If you might just be able to check, please, I can hear that somebody's mic is on in the background. So just please, everybody, make sure that you mute your mics. Then attorney-owned client costs, that is remuneration. An attorney is entitled to in terms of the mandated or agreement with the client. Costs in advance, an attorney is entitled to request a deposit of costs in advance. It obviously remains the property of the client and it's deposited into the trust account until you're able to bill and prove that you've you've um, you know done the work and then that money can be transferred to your business account and also an interim bill. Um, you're not entitled to remuneration until the matter is finalized, but you can agree to a relevant interim bill. But obviously very important to inform your client, especially where there's litigation, that you might uh, be liable 
for your own costs um, as well um, as um, the other party's costs in relation to um, in relation to the relevant litigation. And then you should take note of the Contingency Fees Act and also comply with the relevant regulations in terms or the rules in terms of the Contingency Fees Act. So an arrangement between a legal practitioner and his client in terms of payment of the fee will obviously depend, be dependent on the result obtained and usually a successful result previously. Um, you weren't allowed to, to, to act uh, in relation to uh, a contingency fee, but now it is allowed, obviously, in terms of the strict requirements of the relevant act. So you can now act on contingency if the legal practic practitioner believes that there is a reasonable prospect of success to enter into such an agreement with the relevant client. And if you enter into such a contingency fee agreement with your client, it should set out that you should not be entitled to fees unless you're successful, obviously to the extent set out in the agreement. You shall be entitled to fees equal to or sub um, or higher than the normal fees as set out in the agreement. Higher fee compromises of the normal fee, obviously together with the success fee, a client should be informed that if the case is unsuccessful, this is very important again, they might be liable for the taxed party and party costs of the opposing party. The Act specifically excludes certain cases of pay being taken on a contingency basis, uh, for example, criminal proceedings and family law matters. So the Contingency Fee uh, Act sets out exactly uh, what... Um, what should you know? What how the client should be informed, and what is what you are able to to charge in that relation. But again, remember that if you decide to act on a contingency basis, that this should uh, form part of the cost agreement that you have with your client when you do. You mean you've received your instructions. The next step is definitely to have a fees agreement with your relevant client. Very important as do not overcharge your clients. Attorney found guilty of overreaching can be uh, removed from the role. Um, the PLC provides guidelines in relation to fees if there is no statutory tariff, uh, tariff that exists. And there are certain factors that the taxing master takes into account when the tax bill of costs, and we'll have a look at them now on page 92 of the guide. And remember the written notice of cost that must be provided to a client when accepting an instruction. So obviously it's very, very important to from the outset make your client aware of the relevant fees that is being charged, uh, that, that you'll be charging. And obviously as well, will you be making use of an advocate, what those fees are, etc. So let's just have a quick look at the relevant factors that a taxing master will take into account when they tax the relevant bill. Um, it's on page 92, so just please bear with me whilst I scroll there. Okay. So in assessing a legal practitioner's bills of cost, the taxing committee will be guided by the following principles. Firstly, the amount and the importance of the work done, the complexity of the matter and the difficulty or novelty of the work that was done, the skill, the labor, the specialized knowledge and responsibility involved um, on, on the part of the legal practitioner. So obviously if you specialize in a specific area, um, Obviously, you'll be able to charge more. The number and importance of the documents prepared or perused without necessarily having regard to the length, the place where and the circumstances in which the services or any part thereof were rendered, the time um, expended by the legal practitioner, uh, the amount of the value if there's any uh, where money or property is involved, the importance of the matter to the client, quality of the work that's done, and the experience or the seniority of the relevant legal practitioner. So when party or party cost, cost is being um, calculated by the taxing masters, they are, they are being led by these different factors that you should be aware of. Sorry, we jumped again. 
So obviously you can see that costs are of utmost importance to um, in relation to, to your client and when taking instructions and they should be fully aware of the cost implications of the service that you do render to them. Yesterday we mentioned the importance of trust accounts. So if you're a practicing attorney or practicing attorney should have a trust account. And we also know now that trust account advocates should also have a trust account and they must have a fidelity fund certificate. Um, referral advocates may not hold another person's money in the course of their practice. So obviously there's no need for them to have a trust account or a fidelity certificate. If you don't have such a certificate, you may not hold funds or property on behalf of a client and you may not receive a deposit on account for fees or disbursements in respect of services rendered. If you are a first time trust account practitioner, you must complete a legal practice management course and pay the prescribed fee and provide the proof of such a fee uh, of, of all of these requirements to the LPC when you apply for your Fidelity Fund certificate. And again, um, after the questions yesterday, I just quickly um, went to the LSSA site as well to get some more information on trust accounts. Hi, Prof, can you just perhaps adjust your screen? Excuse me? And perhaps adjust your screen. Adjust it my was, Oh, it yeah. wasn't in presentation mode. Oh, was, apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you for, for uh, pointing that out. Um, I'll do so straight when I get back to the presentation. Thank you very much. Let's just see where we are. So the relevant um, uh, LSSA uh, refers you to the sections of the Act. So it provides that every attorney or an advocate referred to, um, so a trust account advocate should have this certificate. How do you comply? Um, so the practice management training course offered by the Law Society of South African Education Division has been approved by the LC, uh, LPC. So obviously there would be certain service providers that provide this relevant course and um, uh, the LSSA and LEAD is, is one of these institutions that, that do provide this course to enable you to get your Fidelity Fund certificate. Um, and it provides you uh, also what you will be studying when you do this course. So introduction to management, risk management, law, business, finance, systems and technology, practice administration, marketing of legal services, human resources management and strategic manage management. So if you plan to, to do your um, practice management training, obviously you can do, do it through the LSSA as well. Uh, so there are accredited service providers that provide these relevant courses and they are mandatory for you in order to, as a first time practitioner, obviously, who wants to practice uh, for you to, to obtain your, um, your trust certificate. There, there we go, that's better. So very important as well. Can I just ask a question? Yes. Yes. Um, this management course, mm -hmm. is it compulsory for all attorneys? Or is it just compulsory for attorneys who want to open their own firms? Or, and if you want to open a trust account? It, is, a, it is applicable to all attorneys, but obviously different, uh, different rules will apply for attorneys that, for example, practice in your law clinics, and for example, if you practice for, let's say, the South African Human Rights Commission, et cetera, so then there's different rules applicable, so they won't need their own trust accounts. Uh, but that is specifically stipulated in the legislation, but otherwise all practicing attorneys sh should have um, uh, should have a trust account um, uh, um, and then also have the relevant Fidelity Fund certificate. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure. The duration okay. of the, what, what is the duration of the course, ma'am? Sorry to interrupt. Sure, I'm not sure, but let's see if we can quickly go back to that uh, to the site and just see. I don't think it's, it's it takes little. Obviously, there there's the price uh, as well. So it's two thousand six hundred and eighty rands if you'd like to complete the course through through lead. Um, 
it seems like they've got three. Uh, there we go. The, the duration of each intake will be four months as per below. So I take it that this is also. Um, I don't know if the course is four months or is it every four months that the course takes place? Um, let's see if we can follow. Schedule C above link. If we can see what there is, but you can play around on it yourself. I'm not exactly sure what exactly what the what the duration is, but please follow the link that's in provided in the slides, and then you'll be able to see exactly. Yeah, it is all set out. So. Um, you know what is required of you, what the the set out of the module is, price, etc., and when uh, there is intake. I don't think the course is four months. I just think there's an intake every four months in terms of of the of the course. But please just um, just go to the site, play around a bit, and then you'll be able to see um, exactly um, how long the the relevant course would be. Um, can I interrupt you? Yes. And regarding um, the trust accounts, uh, it has to be audited. Now, how often has it got to be audited, or is it man is it mandatory that the an audit be done on the trust accounts? And how 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 often must it be done? And the costs involved, because it, for me, it seems like an audit mandatory audits are very expensive at times, which places a burden on a small practice. Uh, yes, so I am now going to speak uh, under correction as well and from my own recollection, but obviously if even if you, you have your own business, uh, you know, irrespective of whether it's an attorney's firm or whatever the case might be, uh, account, and especially in relation to a trust account, and I trust this is the same, it has to be audited yearly. So yes, that is a, a fee, an, an, an expense that you have to be aware of. So it has to be properly audited and that audit would be, uh, would, uh, you know, take place yearly because obviously your Fidelity Fund certificate also expires every year. So you've got to renew it every year. And if I'm not mistaken, we'll go through the requirements again. I think a requirement of the renewal is is the relevant auditing of of the relevant trust account. So yes, it, it definitely if you are planning to practice uh, for yourself, you know, in a one man firm or for a small firm, that is definitely something that you need to take account of the fact that you need it to be audited. And we all know that CAs are quite expensive as well. So that is an expense that you will need to budget for. Obviously, if you practice for a big firm or a bit of a bigger firm. Um, as an attorney, you don't feel it that much out of your uh, out of your own pocket because I mean it it f forms part of the uh, uh, you know of the firm's costs as well. But yes, definitely something to consider when you are planning to open your own practice. It needs to be audited, and that audit would, uh, according to normal accounting practice, be you know have to be undertaken every year. If we look at the certificate, as I've just mentioned, it's only valid for a for a year. And for reapplying, you must present your previous certificate. And there we go, the certificate from the auditor that your trust account has been audited. And obviously, you must pay again the relevant certificate fee. Just again, very important. The most important thing that I think you can take away from a trust account is that you it's not your money. You keep that money on behalf of your client. Um, you can invest it in a, in a separate trust savings account or any other interest-bearing account, any money that is not immediately required by the relevant cl uh, client and upon obviously that client's requests. And any interest accrued has to be paid over to the Fidelity Fund. If the money is now invested now in the separate investment account, um, 5% of the interest accrued, accrued is payable to the, the Fidelity Fund and the balance would then be paid out to your client. And obviously any interest on the trust account itself goes to the Fidelity Fund. And uh, as you'll see now, the purpose of that is to is, is act as an insurance. If there is any fraud um, by attorneys, then obviously the public um, uh, can can go to the fidelity fund in, in an effort to recoup that monies that were that that was lost. So there's a duty to report to uh, the uh, the the LPC if money in the account is less than the credit balances with a written explanation and uh, if, uh, and a correction. 
a report of a clown's account of its in debit and the reason therefore and a correction or any irregularity in relation to your trust account needs to be reported to the LPC and obviously what corrective action you've taken in terms of correcting that um, that that accounting irregularity. I mentioned yesterday, so please have a look at your guides there as well. Um, there is special arrangements with the banks in relation to trust accounts um, and their management. You can have a have a look there on page 96 of your guide. So if you're planning to, to, to open a trust account, most uh, banks, um, the big banks in South Africa have got special arrangements. So they know exactly, uh, you know, what to open for you, how a trust account um, operates, etc. So um, they are fully aware of the requirements for a trust account and will assist you in opening that relevant account. Um, Obviously, it must be properly managed and very good accounting records kept because, as uh, we've seen, the, um, the relevant account needs to be audited. Um, it must be opened even if there is no trust funds. Um, you can never transfer trust funds to your business account, very important, unless they are due to you. So, in other words, unless you've billed, that is now, uh, you, you've provided the service, you've billed the client and now that that money is due to you and then only can you transfer that money over to your business account. So a proper account has to be kept. Um, and you, sorry, and there's a spelling mistake again there. You can't just transfer an estimated fee. Obviously, it has to be um, the specific fee in relation to the, uh, the services provided and um, otherwise it results to unprofessional conduct. So in terms of Section 87 of the Act, it requires proper accounting, and this includes money received and paid on its own account, money received, held, or paid on account of any other person, money invested in a trust account or other interest-bearing account, any interest on money invested which is paid over or credited, your trust account can be audited by um, the LPC. Also, if there's any unidentified trust money, which is unclaimed for over a year, so they might be but due to some other mistake, you know, you didn't account properly or the, the you know, the file name or the client's name is, is, is not there, but there's money in the fund. Th this needs to be over paid over to the Fidelity Fund. The Fidelity Fund then keeps this money and if the client can later be identified, that money is paid over uh, from the Fidelity Fund back to the client. If needed, the LPC can apply to the High Court to prohibit a practitioner from op operating their trust funds and also appoint a creator bonus to do so. Um, and you can also have a look on page 99 of your guides onwards pertaining to what it takes to to manage your to manage a relevant trust account. Is there any questions pertaining to trust accounts and fidelity fund certificates before we move on to removal from role? The guide obviously provides a lot more information and you're more than welcome to work through it on in, in your own time if you need any specific information or specific reference to sections in the act. Sorry, Prof. Yes. The interest accrued on trust account uh, yes. funds clients. Do you do you need to refund them back to the client? No. The the the, the interest that's accrued on the trust uh, on the trust account goes to the yes. Fidelity Fund. It's paid out for the okay. to the Fidelity Fund. If your client wants you, if the money is not immediately needed, it gets paid into the trust account, and your client wants you to invest that that money. Um, you know, whilst the transaction is busy being processed, whatever the case might be, then the client, it gets invested into a separate account and the client is entitled to um, the Fidelity Fund takes 5% of the interest and the rest of the interest then gets paid out to the relevant client. But in the normal day-to-day -day operations of the trust account, any interest on that account goes to the Fidelity Fund. So, so in simple terms, ninety-five percent goes to the client and five percent to the fidelity. Uh, 
of the remember that if, um, I'm talking about this. There's, there's two separate instances. So you have your trust account. The the money goes into the trust account, but your client doesn't receive any interest on that. The interest goes to the fidelity fund, but this is it might be a very big amount. So your try, client says to you, I want you to invest this money. All right, so it goes to a separate. It doesn't. It goes. It's in your trust account, but then a separate investment. It goes then to a separate investment account, so that the client can earn interest from mm. that. Mm. From that, if your client gives you that instruction, and let's say it's invested for one or two months or whatever the case might be, it's a very big. It's a very big amount. Mm. Um, from that, interest five percent goes to the fidelity fund, and the rest goes. To the client. Okay, thank thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, so yes. Prof, Prof, um, I just want to find out what happens to the money in the trust account if the attorney has been struck from the role, and also what happens to the files, the client's files that are in position of the attorney. Will the legal practice council take the file? And yeah, what's going to happen to the client's file and what, what's going to happen to the money in the trust account um, if the attorney has been struck or removed from the role? So obviously, if the attorney has been struck from the role or removed from the role, um, the, the Legal Practice Council will obviously, uh, you know, step in and will then, you know, can appoint a curator to then deal with the trust money. So uh, the relevant trust monies will then be managed and obviously uh, paid over to the relevant client, uh, you know, that's owed to the clients. And in relation to obviously the files and the relevant documents, if, um, you know, if, if the, the relevant client has, has has paid for the relevant service, obviously the client is entitled to, to, to whatever is in the file or the relevant documentation, whatever the case might be, to obviously go in and instruct another attorney. But obviously it will be managed by the LPC. And um, obviously, if, unfortunately, if you have been struck from the role because there is an irregularity in terms of the finances and with the trust account and there might be a shortfall or some of the money has gone, obviously, then uh, you'll be uh, able to, to institute a claim against the Fidelity Fund to try and retrieve uh, some of those monies. Oh, okay. Uh, Prof? Yes. Uh, yeah, just one question. I just want to check. Um, Noting that the money that's uh, put on investment goes to the fidelity fund and maybe some of the proceeds to the client. I just want to check, you pointed out earlier that uh, um, trust accounts are audited annually. So from whose account uh, are they audited? Because from what I'm hearing, it appears that even if a uh, trust money uh, is invested, nothing from that proceeds goes to the attorney. So from whose account um, uh, are uh, audited statements made that uh, they are taken to, the, to, to accountants? Uh, how do you mean uh, from, so, so irrespective if it's the client's money, it, it, it remains your trust account. So the, the, the auditing happens of um, you know, of of your of of the of the of the relevant trust account, and if there is a separate um, investment account in terms of where trust money is invested, that obviously account is is audited as well. So it is audited irrespective of whether it's the uh, you know you you keep the money on behalf of a client, but but it's audited. The the auditing happens from from your trust account. Did I understand your question correctly? Yeah, isn't it that um, on one side uh, we would have a, an, an attorney opening a business account and then on the other opening a trust account? So yes. my question was, when the auditing of the uh, trust money occurs, where where is it, uh, which, which account must pay? Is it the business account or is it the trust account? Trust. When you pay the auditors, uh, when you pay the auditors, yeah, 
Okay. The the auditors are paid from your business account. So you are you, you can't take money from the trust account to pay the auditors. The money is taken from your business account to pay the relevant auditors. Remember, the trust account money is not your money. So you can't pay the auditors from your client's money. So the, the payment of the auditors would come from your from your own business account. Um, you pay for the auditing of the trust account and the trust investment accounts. So um, you, you, you don't pay the auditors from the trust account. I that, is, that is a fee that, that, that you are responsible for paying from your business account. Yes, Prof. Hello. All right. Hello. If everybody, yes, is there a question? Yes, just a quick one, Prof. I just want to know, uh, you mentioned that the auditors are anomaly from the LPC. So I want to ask if one can get their own private, um, you know, outsourced services of auditors apart from the LPC. No, the auditors are not from the LPC. So you appoint your own uh, uh, you, your own auditing firm, obviously, that's registered, uh, you know, as auditors with one of the professional auditing bodies. The, when I've mentioned that the LPC, the LPC can audit anytime when they feel like it. If there might be a, let's say, uh, a client has, um, you know, laid a complaint uh, against you from the LPC and the LPC wants to see what's going on in your account. At any time, the LPC can audit, you know, get their auditors in and get them to audit your account. But in terms of appointing a relevant auditor uh, to audit your trust account, it's all up to you who you want to appoint, uh, which accounting firm you go to. Obviously, they must just be registered with the relevant auditing authority in South Africa for you to able to get a relevant auditing report. So it's up to you who you who you'd like to 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 get to audit your account. Uh, your trust accounts, it's just that whenever the LPC thinks that there might be an irregularity with the trust funnies or there's a complaint, then the LPC can uh, get their auditors in to see what's going on in those accounts. I hope that clarifies it. Yes, thanks, Prof. Okay, perfect. So let's just carry on with removal from role. So a failure by a legal practitioner to complies, comply with any provisions of the LPA. Hi, yes. Hello. Hi. Can, I, can I ask a question? Um, You're welcome to. In a situation whereby um, a person has maybe asked for money from the bank, maybe probably to buy land, and then normally they'll give you like 50% and then they already pay the other 50% into the uh, attorney's account. And then the process doesn't get, it, it's not completed. If they ask for their money back, they've already paid for registration and everything else, but nothing has happened. Will they get everything back or there's certain um fees that they're not going to get back like registration and all that but the 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 property is not yet registered in their name but what and they get you, back that money what fees mm -hmm. are you, what fees are you referring to so all the money that is paid in the trust account obviously is 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 the client's money and it's dependent mm -hmm. on you know if money has been paid out from the trust account to, to the business account to account for, you know to 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 pay for relevant fees or whatever the case might be so it's dependent on what you know what has been what services have been rendered it what has been charged for that and what is left of the client's money in the relevant trust account the process so, is not complete there's nothing happening yes in so that the client, sense, you get everything because you can't register a bond that is not even there. Yes. So yeah. if the if the no service has been rendered and no bond obviously has been registered, then the client is entitled to their full fee. Everything. From everything that yeah, yes, unless I mean anything has been paid or any service has been rendered. But uh, you know, the money would be paid on specific instruction that the money is for X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Money gets put into your trust account and it can only be used for X, Y, and Z and nothing else. 
if the client suddenly ter terminates the mandate or if something falls through, you have to pay back the client the relevant money that is in the trust account. Okay. You, ca you can't decide, oh, I've done, you know, decide for yourself, you know, what you th you think that you're entitled to a part of that. It all gets paid back to, to, to the relevant client unless it's for services that you have provided and can prove that prove that you've provided that service. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Pleasure. So failure by a legal practitioner to comply with any of the rules of the LPA can obviously, you can be called before a disciplinary committee. If you're found guilty of misconduct, they can have apply to have you struck from the role. Uh, they can or they can suspend you from practice or interdict them from dealing with trust mon money. And also it would mean that you're no longer a fit and proper person to practice law. Theft of trust funds is a very serious offence and you will be removed from the role. And not only will you be removed from the role, you will be criminally prosecuted. Unfortunately, this is also the, the one transgression uh, for which most, uh, you know, most uh, um, attorneys uh, are, are struck from the role is, is when it comes to trust funds and, you know, uh, irregular accounting or the fact that trust monies just disappear. But just please be aware of the fact and you'll also see that there is a vulnerability uh, of practitioners to sp specific fraud syndicates. Uh, go have a look through and a page through from page 105 onwards you know, where a dubious client will, you know, you know, get you to pay money, monies into the trust account and the, the monies are then, uh, you know, siphoned through the, 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 the trust account and fraud is, 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 is being perpetrated in, in a sense. You should be aware of the fact that there is fraud happening and that there are fraud syndicates that target um, attorneys and, and their trust accounts. And the onus is on the practitioner to ensure that the recipient account belongs to the payee when a payment is made because the bank doesn't ch check it. It's, it's your responsibility to check. I'll say leave the shoes in there. Hi, can you just please make sure that your mic is muted? Let me see if I can track the person. Sorry. Perfect, thank you. So the Fidelity Fund is not legally bound to assist practitioners who fall victim to this sort of fraud. So it's your responsibility to make sure that um, the correct payouts are made in terms of your account. And if there might be any fraud on your trust account, it, um, it means that uh, the Fidelity Fund is not necessarily going to be responsible for that fraud. Um, the... Guide also goes into uh, quite a bit of detail on bridging finance in relation to conveyancing practices, and you're more than welcome to to work through that. Um, if you'd like some more information in relation to to bridging finance and how conveyancing transactions work, on page one hundred five onwards. Uh, sorry, ma'am, I have a question. Yes. I'm um, going back to overcharging a client. Uh, my question is, is there a limit on um, how much a client should be charged or should not be charged? Or does it depend on the transaction? Or let me say that does it depend on what you are representing the client for? Yes, so there, there's various uh, guidelines that's that's available. If I'm not mistaken, the LPC and if, if I'm not mistaken, the LSSA also provide guides, like guidelines to attorneys in terms of what's to be charged. And obviously, uh, the fee that you, you, you charge your client would be dependent on many factors. Um, so obviously, it would be dependent on the relevant expertise of the attorney. If they are a specialist, for example, and it's the same with advocates as well, if they're a specialist in the, in, in the specific area obviously uh, your years of experience so obviously an attorney with with years and years in experience will be able to charge more than a very junior attorney but there is obviously a certain standard um 
standard fees that's asked, uh, you know, uh, you know, in terms of hourly rates, etc. that is asked. So you need to make sure that when you do start up a practice, that you see that your fees are more in line with what, uh, you know, what, what is charged within the profession, somebody of your, your own experience, uh, your own specialization. So it is a good idea to have a, to get hold of those guidelines in, in terms of what is charged uh, to make sure that you're not overcharging. But obviously, it will be dependent on many factors, but it is a very good idea to get hold of the guidelines to make sure that you are in line with it. But obviously, uh, it will be variable, as I've just mentioned, depending on, on various factors. Um, but you have to make sure that you don't charge exuberant amounts. And, and it also... Um, you know, comes down to, to dishonesty and especially with contingency fees as well. And we all know, um, you know, of the uh, the Bobrov case, um, you know, and the, the, the big fraud that happened there in terms of overcharging clients and also irregularities with trust monies, that um, there is limits as well. And please have a look at the Contingency Fees Act as well in terms of um, what you're able, uh, you know, you, you, you can't, for example, especially, in, and that's unfortunately uh, where a lot of the fraud happens is in RAF matters and in medical negligence matters where you get big payouts um, and then you take most of the money for yourself and only leave a very small portion for the client. So th those will be cases where there's uh, would be, where, where there would be a flagrant over overcharging. But if you plan to... If you don't plan to, to practice in a firm and if you plan to start your own um, your own practice, it's a very good idea just to have a look around, get some guidelines and also see and speak to colleagues, um, you know, with the, that's more or less in the in the same position that you are in terms of how much they are charging and make sure that you are um, that you are in line. And obviously, in, in that regard, uh, that you you you, ch you charge a competitive rate as well. Let me just see before we go on with the termination of the mandate. It's now just about 20 past six. Would it be in order if we take a, just a quick 10 minute uh, water break? Yes, no problem. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, let's just take a quick 10 minute break. Be back in about 10 minutes um, and then we can continue. I think we'll be, we will be uh, finished quite early tonight. Um, <laughs> So, so let's do a quick 10 minutes if that's fine with everybody. All right. Thank you. Be back now. Thank you.
OK, guys, I'm back. Uh, we can proceed again. I also just checked the slides. There's not much uh, that we are going to continue with, so we are almost there. Um, let me just see where I stopped. OK, yes, we are at the termination of mandate. I hope everybody can see the screen. So your client can terminate their mandate with you at any time and attorney should or cannot withdraw without any sound reason. If a client terminates the mandate, you have to withdraw as the attorney of record and you need to file accordingly with the court. When would it be deemed um, all right with you or with good reason for an attorney to withdraw? Uh, when there is improper conduct on the part of the client, uh, deliberate fraud, where there is certain personality clashes and it's just impossible to work with the client, when the client does not accept advice or persists on defending an action if the attorney very strongly advises that the client should settle, uh, also when the client obviously fail, fails to pay you. Um, and you are, as an attorney, you're obviously entitled to uh, the funds up to the point of termination. So obviously termination, immediately withdraw as your attorney record and you need to file accordingly with the court. So this is the first leg. Uh, you know, yesterday we, we mentioned that as an attorney, you have a relationship with um, your client, you have a relationship with your colleagues and third parties, you have a, a relationship with the state and the community as a whole. So the most part of the guide is dedicated to the client, which we have um, dealt with. And then obviously there's a relationship towards third parties and your colleagues as well. In terms of um, third parties, uh, there's a general duty of care, obviously, that's regulated by the law of delict. Uh, you should not take advantage of a third party if they are unrepresented or negotiate a transaction whilst aware that a third person is not aware of their rights. And then obviously in relation to, to colleagues, um, you need to be collegial at all times. Although you are on opposing sides, uh, we are all colleagues and um, we maintain a good uh, relationship and a good working relationship because at the end of the day, uh, it's just, uh, uh, you know, it's just your job, it's just your work, um, both parties, uh, you know, you're, you're basically in that sense, you're on the same side. Um, it is an accepted principle that it is improper, whether directly or through another, to contact the client of another legal practitioner without their consent. So if you plan to do so, you obviously first, uh, you know, phone the relevant legal practitioner and tell them uh, about your plans and whether it's in order for you to contact um, to contact their client for whatever reason, for whatever the reason might be. Um, in terms of being collegial as well, it is good to have collegial relationships because uh, you never know when another colleague might refer a client if it's not within their area of specialization, or whatever the case might be, when that relevant colleague might refer a client to you. Witnesses, so this is obviously as well um, as um, another party that 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 you that you owe um, an ethical an ethical relationship to as well. So a legal practitioner or client client uh, do not owe a witness. A attorney can interview any person who they believe is in possession of information which may assist their case and cannot be deprived of this right by the fact that the other party has taken a statement or subpoenaed the person. The other side should be notified, obviously, of the interview beforehand. Um, the guide provides a lot of, um, you know, to-dos in relation to witnesses. We can quickly have a look at page 170 there. And it's very, just very important to be cautious to witnesses at all times. Don't be rude of them. Don't be rude towards them. Um, Keep them informed as well. If you plan to make use of a witness, um, you know, and you tell them to be there at a certain time of the court and then they just sit there the whole day and they actually only need it the following day. day. So please keep them informed. Be cautious to all witnesses. Um, 
um, and, 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 and treat them um, with the necessary and due respect. If we, quick, we can quickly have a look at page 117 of the guide pertaining to witnesses. You'll see that the guide has quite a lot of information in terms of do's and don'ts in relation to witnesses. Um, Just get the right page number there. Oh, I hate scrolling. No, I can't remember the page number. I think it's 177. Let's see if we can if we can trace it. Page 117. 117 or 177? 117. 117. Ah, thank you guys. This happens after a long day, which I trust it's been for all of us. Is it 117? There's the, there we go. Uh, so witnesses, you'll see that the guide provides quite a lot of information on witnesses. Um, state witnesses, obviously, constitutional court has ruled. The rule of practice prohibiting the interview of uh, interviewing of state witnesses by an accused for his legal representative without the permission of the prosecuting authorities unconstitutional. An accused person has a right to consult a state witness without prior permission of the prosecuting authority in circumstances where his or her right to a fair trial could be impaired. If on the special facts of a particular case, the accused cannot properly obtain a fair trial. So obviously you just need to be aware of the rules in relation to, to, to witnesses and the common courtesy that is owed to witnesses in that regard. The um, guide provides a, quite a lot of information there and then you are more than welcome to just work through it. Um, I'd, I am just touching on the most important aspects as I feel that if you want any more information or particular information, you're more than welcome to, to, to read the guide in your own in, in your own time. Then council, um, page 118 is relevant to, to council. Um, and the duty we owe towards council. You're welcome to, to have a look there as well. So the obligation to pay fees had to flow from an agreement between the parties. This agreement could either be an express agreement or by implication. Council obviously was not allowed in terms of ethical rules to receive instructions or payment from a client and they had previously been suspended if they failed to observe this rule. If there was not an express agreement between council and attorney, the necessary implication, therefore, was that it could never be an implied term of the agreement that council looked at the client to pay fees. So obviously, council was not responsible, uh, could not get the fees from the client. Obviously, they have to go to the relevant attorney to obtain the fees. The client pays the attorney. The attorney um, then uh, uh, um, pays the relevant council. Council would not even be permitted to conclude an express agreement that his fees be paid by anyone else than his attorney. It therefore followed logically that an attorney would always in South Africa law be liable for council's fees, even in event of the client not paying the attorney, which is obviously quite important. So the attorney is responsible for the fees towards the relevant council. Um, Let me just move over again to the slides. So it's also the attorney's duty to provide counsel with comprehensive instructions. Very important to attend all the consultations with the relevant counsel, as well as the court proceedings. A matter, sorry, there's a spelling mistake again. A matter should not be stood down for instructions to be taken from an attorney. So on the relevant day, when the litigation takes place, the matter is being heard in court. Um, you'll be surprised that a lot of time matters are stood down because uh, the relevant attorney is not around and the advocate then has to stand down to take instructions from, um, from the relevant attorney and therefore the relevant client as well. 
So make sure when there is a matter to be heard and you've instructed counsel that it's not just counsel that attends the relevant hearing, that you attend the relevant hearing with counsel. And obviously as well, preferably with the client as well. Meetings with counsel is always at counsel's chambers and it is very important that the attorney always be present if the attorney obviously is not present obviously a candidate attorney or somebody that's uh, you know from the relevant office that's been instructed but always make sure that uh, the relevant um attorney is is is, is present when there is a meeting at council chambers and uh, the uh, council and a client should never be meeting alone there should always be an attorney present and obviously in relation to what we've just discussed pay the relevant fees of your counsel timelessly, otherwise you'll not be able to brief them again. And word spreads um, as well. You'll be surprised how small uh, the legal fraternity and community really is. Then in, re in relation to the attorney's ethical responsibilities and relationship, so we've done clients, third parties, um, colleagues and then obviously towards the court as well. An attorney is admitted to practice and can be removed from the role, uh, the role by the High Court and as legal practitioners we are all officers of the court. Uh, there's a duty on us not to abuse the process of the court or hamper your opponents in the conduct of their case. There is a duty towards the court and a responsibility towards uh, colleagues to act honestly, conscientiously and openly for the proper administration of justice. Again, just some uh, general rules, always dress suitably. And um, if you are a, an, an advocate appearing before uh, counsel, appearing before, uh, or obviously an attorney that's got right, uh, right of appearing in the High Court, and you are appearing uh, for the first time, uh, you need to introduce yourself in chambers before uh, the relevant judge. Always be courteous to court staff, especially if you're a CA. Um, we know as CAs, we are usually uh, tasked with going to court, finding files, um, you know, looking for documents. It's very, it's it's very important to have a, a good relationship with the relevant um, court staff. Um, it it will only assist you um, in in obtaining what you what you need. Can I just ask that you please mute your mic? Okay, your all right. So also when court is in session and when there is, um, you need to know when to be silent. So when not to speak, it would be when an oath is administered to a witness, when a prisoner is being sentenced, when judgment is being delivered, when court is either opened or closed and when a prisoner is arraigned. So no talking to counsel at that stage or conversating with a client or witness as the case might be, there should be silence, um, especially uh, most times, but especially um, during these specific times in court. So these are just um, uh, common courtesy rules, if you might if you might say so, in relation to, to, to your conduct at court. When a judge or magistrate enters or leaves, um, it is... Uh, a courtesy bow is made towards the bench. Also, when you leave or enter the court, it is very rude to just see if you want to see who's in court or what matters uh, is being heard to just pop your head in and look around and then, um, you, you know, go out of court. If you want to know what's going on in court, you enter court, you bow towards the relevant brow presiding officer, uh, you make your observations you bow again and you exit the court. So never just peek around, uh, you know, sort of around the corner or around the door to see what's going on or who is in court or if it's in session. If you want to have a conversation with counsel or you want to bring, bring something to their attention, uh, do not start, uh, you know, a whispering conversation. It is practice to rather hand uh, uh, counsel a note 
rather than discussing an issue in court. I trust that you know how to address um, the relevant presiding officer in court and the high court, it's my lord or my lady or my lordship or my ladyship. Outside of court, uh, if you bump into each other, um, you know, uh, you know, and in, 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 the, in the coffee shop that's close by, you refer to uh, the presiding officer's judge and magistrate, and magistrate court is your worship and outside magistrate. When you address court, you need to stand up. And when another party is addressing the court, you need to sit down. Always be properly instructed and prepared. Um, you'll also be surprised how many attorneys and counsel are, are not prepared. I started off as a clerk in, in our high courts and had um, sometimes just sat there staring at, 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 at counsel. You, at council or attorneys, I swear they open their files for the first time when they actually, um, you know, before the presiding officer and 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 our presiding officers are not stupid and they can immediately pick up if you are not prepared and properly instructed. Then again, dress code, robe and bib, dark clothes underneath, black bottoms, closed shoes. You need to robe beforehand and not in court and also only if you are formally appearing. So if you are just there to maybe, you know, attend a matter out of interest or whatever the case might be, if you are not formally appearing, you uh, are not robed. Be cautious to the opposing party and to witnesses, as I've mentioned. And Lou, just, can I ask a question? Yes, you're welcome to. Um, I had an issue with uh, the dress code, especially when it comes to what clothes you're supposed to wear, like black bottoms, clothes, shoes and... Um, is it uh, is there a, an authority that can say that we supposed to dress up like? Because most of the time it says that we should actually wear dark and white, but I've seen in the other courts that they can wear colors and what what. Can a magistrate call you to order, or is there a law or, or, or authority or anything that you can use to say this is how you're supposed to dress? Uh, there's not a specific law, but it's just seen as, as a code of good practice. I think at some stage uh, it, um, there was um, a, a rules that governed it, but there is no longer. But it's it, it's it, it's just a rule of good practice. So it's 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 frowned upon uh, to 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 wear bright clothings or to wear to to wear very high heels, for example, uh, and open shoes. Um, sometimes it's a bit more lax in the match courts than it is in the high court. But traditionally, the clothes would be, um, you know, obviously with your robe and your bib, it would be black underneath or uh, dark brown, uh, possibly, or an, a navy color would be acceptable. But it, as I've said, it's 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 a it's it's been practiced and it's seen as a sign of respect towards the court and the presiding officer. Um, as I've mentioned before, you'll be surprised how tiny the legal fraternity is. And, you know, they, if, if you don't dress appropriately, there will always be whispers, you know, uh, and and the bench and your, the presiding officers sees it as a sign of disrespect when you are not properly dressed. So it's, it's just a practice. Um, and to show respect towards the court is to to wear dark uh, dark clothes underneath um, the relevant robe, or if you are you know uh, uh, the attorney attending with the relevant counsel, obviously um, you, you know to wear uh, to wear proper um, to to wear the proper attire. So there's no specific rule. You are not going to be thrown out of court, but it is frowned upon, if I can say so. Um, can I interrupt you? Yes. Um, I once um, witnessed a judge um, admonishing a, 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 a male attorney because he didn't have a tie on. Do the men have to have ties or not? Was that changed or was that just a, a grumpy judge? Well, it depends. Uh, remember, uh, it might be that also, I mean, m most of the time, 
you you wear a bib so that would cover the tie so if you if you don't have a bib obviously i think the least that you should be wearing is a tie but that's the problem is that um if you might get a grumpy judge on the day or not if you've got uh, you know some bright clothes on if you're not wearing a tie or if you don't wear a bib so it is best that you that you wear the proper attire um because you don't want it to influence um the judge negatively in any way you obviously uh, want it to be uh, um you know um representable for you and your client and get get the best outcome and you don't want the focus to be on your dress so you so the best is to abide by the relevant rules so just make sure that you are properly dressed and yes um if you get a grumpy judge or a judge that is um you know feels very strongly about it they can call you out for your relevant dress uh for your relevant dress code so it's best to go properly dressed uh, and in obviously uh, the right colors as well. Um, sorry, Prof. <clears throat> I'm not sure whether the guidelines they still exist, but I know that um, previously, when the LPC was still called the Law Society, there were the so called um, dress code guidelines that is guiding um, attorneys on what to wear when they go to appear. Yes at the high court. I'm not sure whether those guidelines, they still exist, but I remember they were published um, um, at the website of the Legal Practice Council yes. to guide attendees on what to wear when they appear before the judge. I think the guidelines so they, they, are... there were guidelines before. Yes, the guidelines are still in existence, and I actually think the guide refers Because, ma'am, I, I lost you somehow. Excuse me? Hello. I think she's gone. Yes. Sorry. Um, so yes, um, obviously there is guidelines in terms of what to wear, but it's not it's not a regulation, it's not a rule, it's not legislated. So it's it's not enforced, but it is it's a guideline and it is therefore strongly advised that you that you abide by that relevant guideline in terms of what to wear at court. Um, so that is in terms of dress. Also take note that as from 2020 or 2019, cases are now managed through can the I court. Ask, yes. Do candidate attorneys also wear robes when appearing in court when given a matter? Um, if I'm not mistaken, yes, they do. So if if you do appear before court, you are robed. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, ma'am, I, I lost you because I asked a question and then my signal was, I lost signal somehow. Yes, um, I've, also, I've also realized that where I am, even the magistrate sometimes would come with a shirt, scotch shirt, the prosecutor's pink shirts, like, uh, I don't know. Who's going to call who to order if it's like that? Yes, well, as I've mentioned, it's it's more relaxed sometimes in the magistrate's court. And also, it's also dependent, you know, you know, different divisions, different courts and, and different uh, uh, in, in the different provinces in South Africa. Obviously, some would be more stricter than others. So obviously, you'll have to see in the area in which you practice and the course in which you practice, what is acceptable behavior and whatnot, and see that you abide by those relevant rules. But just be aware of the fact that if you, the, the dress in the match court where you uh, might be regularly appearing is more relaxed, that's all good and fine. But just take note then maybe when you go to the high court that it might be different and that you're then, um, that you just make sure that in the day that you go to the high court, uh, that you're more conservatively dressed, that you would, for example, be dressing, uh, you know, as you appear in the match court. So it'd be all de dependent on the relevant division that you're appearing in, the relevant court that you're appearing in. If um, the, you know, the division is more relaxed, that's all good and fine. You can abide by that. But you will find that it differs from division to division. Or, for example, you'll find that they're very strict in Houting. But, for example, if you might be going to... Um, you know, KZN where they might be more relaxed, but just take note and 
just to be on the safe side, I would just say, um, you know, abide by um, by the relevant guidelines and 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 dress and dress accordingly. Um, okay. I've before. Thank you, ma'am. It's a pleasure. Uh, before I may mention that cases are now managed through um, what is known as case lines, so the court online evidence management application system. So if you and especially CAs as well, you'll need to familiarize yourself with the system in terms of it's now electronically how, uh, you know, pleadings are filed, etc. Uh, would now all go through this, um, this, this case lines system. So you need to familiarize yourself with that system, obviously. Within the relevant division um, that you will be working on and representing your clients just Tying in with um, our discussions on trust account and fidelity fund, uh, fidelity fund um, <coughs> certificate is insurance. So legal practitioners, uh, practitioners insurance indemnity fund or the LPIIF um, uh, is provides for negligence by legal practitioner and special extension is provided to support staff. And to be able to be covered by this insurance indemnity fund, you have to be in possession of a valid uh, uh, fidelity fund certificate. And then you get the legal practitioners, the fidelity fund, the LPFF, and that is for misappropriation of trust funds. And this is to the benefit of the client. Uh, so the uh, claimants should first, or the, the client and the claimant should first try and claim directly from the legal practitioner. And if they're, they're not able to, they can then claim from the Fidelity Fund. Have a look at Section 342B. We'll have a look at Section 342B of the LPC on page 139 of the guide. Um, Uh, this section provides that if theft is committed by a legal practitioner and the practice or advocate or any other person employed by that practice or supervised, uh, supervised by that legal practitioner or advocate, by a legal practitioner or person acting as executor or administrator of the estate of a deceased per person or by a legal practitioner or person employed by that legal practitioner who is a trustee in an insolvent estate or in any other similar capacity, excluding a curator, will uh, uh, obviously be covered. And in order to institute a claim against the LPFF, a claimant must prove that he or she has suffered a monetary loss by reason of theft committed by the legal practitioner, candidate legal practitioner, or an employee of the legal practitioner um, of the money entrusted by or on behalf of the claimant to that legal practitioner. So uh, these are uh, the the uh, the persons that's covered by that relevant fidelity fund. If funds are misappropriated, the client uh, can then so, uh, seek recourse um, through um, through uh, the fidelity fund. The claim must be lodged within three months of becoming aware of the theft, or reasonably ought to have been aware of the theft theft and it does not protect uh, um, the practitioner but again it's for the public now the legal practitioner's insurance indemnity fund is for if there's an uh, if there might be a claim like uh, negligence against an uh, um, you know against an attorney um, that you might be covered through that many firms have additional cover as well and some firms um, may request this cover uh, uh, you know, if there's a, a, a sorry, it's not firms, but some clients may uh, re uh, firms may request this cover before they, um, you know, big firms that you know do do big commercial and uh, um, do big commercial transactions, etc., may actually uh, request um, you know additional cover before they instruct a re instruct a relevant attorney's firm. Client management, you'll see again and again in the guide at a couple of spaces. Um, the fees agreement is mentioned and um, Section 35C 
of the Act, and, and we've gone through that. You can recap that on page 141. So in terms of you've got to discuss the relevant fee, the relevant if the, you're going to um, um, give a brief to an, an, an advocate. Um, so you may need to make sure the fees agreement is really important and at the outset after you've taken your instructions from the client. And it is recommended that an attorney should have a double database to register and record all the client's cases. And obviously, FICA, Poppy, everything is applicable. Uh, the guide gives uh, quite some guidelines in terms of how to uh, to, to properly um, you know, keep this data and makes some suggestions in that regard. So there you can have a look on page 142 of the guide onwards. And yes, I think for today that is us. Do you have any questions pertaining to legal ethics or something that you've read in the guide that you're still uncertain about? Um, yes, I, think, I just... Yes, you're welcome. I, to. Yes, can I just quickly ask something? Um, I just want to know... Um, the slides that we have here, are these enough to complete those two assignments that we have due for legal ethics? Or do we, uh, do you think we need to go into more depth um, in the study guide with all that case law and so forth? Yo. <laughs> I would think um, that the notes are pretty detailed. Um, you'll see I have touched on most uh, of the issues of the most important aspects and I've left out all the examples. So I think use the use the slides and the, the guidelines and prepping. If there's any uncertainty, obviously you can refer back to to the guide. Um, and um, also, yes, on certain key aspects. But yes, you can definitely use your use the slides and prep. I'm um, actually I'll be emailing the slides as we log off and I'll also email you um, the CLP slides as well as soon as um, do you want the CLP slides beforehand? Before we start tomorrow's lecture, I'll email that as well. And then Zukiswa yes, can just, yes. Zukiswa can then just um, distribute those slides tomorrow. Yes, You'll please. Please, you. for tomorrow, please. Thank you. Yes, I will definitely do so because I make use mostly of my slides in terms of the constitutional law practice and not so much the guide. I do refer some at some spaces to the guide, but I the guide I sometimes find to be a bit theoretical. For example, the different forms of democracy, uh, rule of law and things, which I think is theory that you would have covered during um, constitutional law, fundamental rights at varsity. So I'll be just focusing on some practical aspects of litigation and specifically, um, you know, litigating before the constitutional court as we're dealing with constitutional litigation. And I know you do all the high court and match court things. So we'll be focusing tomorrow mostly on, on constitutional court litigation and litigating um, fundamental rights. Um, but I'll but I'll email you the uh, but I'll email Zukiswa the slides so that you'll have them ready for tomorrow and then you can follow the slides as we go along. Any questions Thank or you queries? So much. Uh, Ma um, uh, slides for it. this lecture. Yeah. Mm. Are you going to only send a PowerPoint slides or your video the recording? Because we have realized in other lectures we're struggling to get the recordings. Yes, I'm not responsible for recording the lecture, so uh, the recording is uh, is made by the LSSA, so that is um, Sukis one them, so you'll have to ask them if you'd like access to the recording. I can give you um, access to my slides by all means. I'm going to email them straight away now um, to, uh, um, to, to lead so they can distribute them to you, but unfortunately I don't have access to, to the recording, so I won't be able to, to attach the recording for you. Can um, you recommend to them to put uh, recordings for us? Because some students are being affected with load shedding and they don't get enough of the lecture, you know? Like the guy who did not attend yesterday, yes, surely yesterday. he missed a lot yesterday. Yes, I'm sure that in those circumstances, the, the recordings will be, mm. be, made, be made available to the students. Um, but yes, yes, uh, yes I don't have you. a problem in sharing my my slides or my the notes that I've used uh, for you guys over the past two days. Is there any questions or queries that you might have? 
Um, and just in relation to, to to the trust accounts and in relation to the Fidelity Fund certificates, um, it's a, I think as well that some of the rules and regulations are attached at the back of your guide, if I'm not mistaken. So obviously you have access to them and it's the best to, if there's any uncertainty, to go to right straight, not even to the guide, but to the primary source which is um, the relevant legislation, the relevant rules and the relevant regulations to provide yourself with clarity in exactly what is required. Because you'll see as well, um, in terms of preparing, for example, your admission application, it's just important to follow the letter of the law and, and comply with, with every single, you'll almost mention them, you know, with every single um, little um, uh, rule or regulation that's prescribed in terms of what you should be able to prove. Um, and that's why okay. I refer to that site because that's very handy because that's exactly what they set out uh, set out for you in that regard. Any further questions or queries? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, not just to draw us back, I just want to find out what is uh, if there is a difference between PVT and PLT. PVT and uh, PVT and PLT. Yes. Is it referred to in the guide or in regulations or the law? Where, where, where is the? I think PVT stands for this particular program that we are doing now. And the PLT, practical legal training as well. So students are kind of like confused with regards to whether they are the Can same thing. Can I help you? Somebody's welcome to intervene yet. Do you know something? <laughs> yeah, when when you register your articles, that's PVT, Practical Vocational Training. That is your articles. You get that on yes. your contract because you sign a contract when you when you apply to register your articles. That's PVT. And then this, what we do in this class is PLT, which is Practical Legal Training. Okay. Yes. Now that you're mentioning it, that's absolutely correct, and that's the terms that's used. Uh, uh, that's actually the terms that's used. So yes, PVT is your articles, and then PLT is this. Yeah, this this practical uh, the the training course that's offered. Yes. Uh, thank you. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Can we get? Hello. A yes, uh, I had a question during your presentation, which I decided to reserve for when uh, we are at the end of your presentation. Mm -hmm. With regards to a uh, contingency fee agreement, in a situation where the client and an, uh, and an attorney, they conclude a contingency fee agreement and then the client terminates the mandate before the matter can be resolved, is the, is the attorney then not entitled to anything for services rendered? It will depend on the relevant terms, uh, uh, the relevant terms of the agreement. But remember, if you if you that's the purpose of you signing a contingency fee is that you will only be paid once if you're successful. So that is sort of the risk that you run. Uh, so that is the purpose of a contingency fee. The purpose of a contingency fee is that you'll only get paid if you are successful. So in other words, unfortunately, the, the the other side of the coin uh, could also be correct that you get nothing if you are unsuccessful and also so so that is so, sort of the double edged sword if you'd like in terms of of contracting in terms of the contingency fee as i've just mentioned uh, in the slides as well that there are specific requirements uh, in terms of, of of the agreement that you need uh, and the, the matters as well in terms of which you're able to to claim a contingency. But yes, contingency is you you get your fee if you're successful. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes, I just want Hi, to uh, uh, hello. I was speaking to one of, of, of the guy who is who's currently doing that at least. Uh, he told me that uh, if uh, you have succeeded on a trial, you can also claim the uh, opposite in terms of the uh, legal fees. Is that true? Um, f f f from the opposition, remember, we referred to party to party costs. So if you yes, uh, are, yes. if you but are on, the, the successful party, there was no declaration of uh, legal uh, uh, fees cost uh, 
uh, liability by a uh, presiding officer, but you've just uh, succeeded a case and you just want to claim your legal cost except expenses. So are you referring to party and party costs? So if you are the successful party. Civil case. Yes, a civil case, yes. So if you are the relevant successful party, um, obviously costs follow suit. So in most instances, except for in constitutional litigation where it works a bit differently, uh, you are responsible. Um, you might be responsible for the other party's costs. So it's, it's in other words, the, the, the person play, but it pays party to party costs. So in other words, it goes to the taxing master, it's taxed, but you yourself might still be liable to your attorney for attorney client costs. So the cost of the relevant litigation, et cetera, would be party to party costs. But you, as even if you are successful, there might still be certain fees, et cetera, that you are responsible towards your attorney for attorney client costs uh, that is above and beyond the party to party costs. And that's why it's so important to write at the outset uh, when you you need to conclude your fees agreement with your with your client and you need to inform them of that what you might be responsible, that if you also, very importantly, that if there is a plan to litigate and if you do litigate and if you are unsuccessful, you might be responsible for the other party's party to party costs. But you are still responsible towards your attorney as well for attorney to client costs as well. Is I there must, another? Uh, yes. Yes. Can I ask, in terms of the the previous fee, I think the one before the previous one about the contingency fee, is it mm. ethical to add a clause that says if the client terminates the mandate without a valid reason, then as a legal practitioner, you are entitled or he, he or she is uh, liable to pay for all the, the expenses that you would have uh, incurred by then? Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not too sure. I'll have to have a look at the relevant sections from the Contingency Fee Act, but I'm almost, it feels to me almost that it's not going to be allowed for, and I'm sure that it's regulated by the Act. So I would just read the specific uh, sections of the Act, but I, I trust that depending on what, uh, you know, what the Act says, I, I almost think that you will not necessarily be able, and it also depends where in the case, how far along, et cetera. But yes, in terms, if you ever plan to act in terms of a con on contingency fees or on contingency fee basis, make sure that, you do, that you're knowledgeable about the act or the, uh, the, the requirements of the act. And as I've mentioned, they most, um, they most um, people mostly act on contingency fee basis and RAF matters and their medical negligence. So if you're planning to specialize in those, you'll, you'll need to have in-depth knowledge about the Contingency Fees Act. So, or, or maybe uh, because the, 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 the legal costs are usually recovered from, uh, from REV, so maybe uh, one can liaise with the legal practitioner who's going to take over the matter to say uh, when you do the... the the legal cost and taking you to the tax master and everything, then you will be uh, entitled to the work that you perform in terms of making copies, traveling and all those things. Because I think it would be uh, unfair on you not to be able to yes, recover I, those. Uh, it, it might be uh, that you, you are able to claim, but you'll just have to go and check the Contingency Fees Act specifically for the details there. Um, Prof? Yes. Um, can I just put my two yeah. cents on it? You're welcome uh, to. What, what mostly have terminations uh, is that uh, when you are uh, you have you are acting uh, under contingency, most attorneys specify in their um, special power of attorney that if you do terminate, therefore they are entitled for uh, what will be called that the party on party tariff which is um, will be like double the tariff of uh, what it would have been in the normal circumstances where um, the, mandate, uh, the matter has, has been finished with them. So mostly they do claim against the client, 
based on that fact that they specify on their power of attorney because contingency fee agreement per se it doesn't say that uh, you can claim against a person who terminates. However, as a person who as an attorney, you need to specify to your client that. However, if you you do terminate me while I have I'm acting on your behalf, this is what I'll be entitled for. Mostly, it's your fees, um, but on a party and party scale. Yes. Yes. There we go. And it would, would, would also have to be then set out in the relevant fees agreement so that your client knows what they're agreeing to and that if they cancel, that there might be a, a responsibility in terms of, of, of the relevant fees. Prof, um, may I ask a question? Uh, Sorry. Yeah, um, okay, you can go first. Um, just there are some questions in the chat box. Now, will you do you address them or who addresses the questions that you know haven't been raised verbally and vocally but have been asked in the chat box? Where do we find the answers to those? Um, I'll quickly have a look on them. And if you have posted a an and question in the text box pertaining to the you can just raise it verbally with me as well. Um, is there anything? No, not really. I do see there is a question here. I, I, I've just lost it here. But um, there is a question that uh, hasn't been raised vo vocally. So um, I'll just go up and see. Just hold uh, um, Unless the person that put it down wants to vocalise and ask it. Yes, please. If I've, if I've missed your question, if you've posted a question in the chat box, I've missed it, just please raise it now. You're more than welcome to raise it uh, verbally now. Um, can I just raise a, a, another question in the meantime? You're welcome to. Um, I just want to check. I've heard that um, um, a punitive costs, um, is that different to party and party costs? Uh, I think uh, putative costs, you know what, um, is that not putative mainly? means that you, yes it is different to party to party costs and I'm quickly you know what if you don't know the best way to do something is to google it <laughs> so I'm gonna google there is definitely a difference <laughs> okay. of my remembering it and I'm just gonna do the th one thing if you know that we all do if we don't know is um there's another word for it as well that I'm not able to um Um, get to now, but I think it, there, there might be a cost. It might be what you're referring to, that if attorney is, uh, is, is, is extremely negligent in the way in which it conducts, actually the court may order costs against the relevant attorney as well. So that might be what you're referring as well. And that serves as, a, you know, a cost order to basically um, 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 sort of it's a deterrent to not be extremely negligent so there, there, there is there there is a sort of uh, uh, that cost order if i'm not mistaken it might be putative i'm not too sure uh, but the, there is definitely a, a cost order that can be awarded as well um, um, against if there is extreme negligence i can't exactly uh, uh, recall the term but 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 i'll see if i can find out and then we can discuss it tomorrow during clp as well um, I wanted to raise a question after that one. Hi, Prof. Um, what happens to a candidate attorney if the principal is removed from the role, uh, is removed from practicing as an attorney? So obviously you will then have to, to, to cede your articles to another relevant principal if they're able to take you. And um, it is something that obviously will also have to be disclosed uh, when you do your admission. Uh, but if they are removed, um, you know, mid-attorney mid cycle, obviously you have to look towards the session of your articles to another to another attorney to complete. And then um, it is something that will have to be raised in your admission papers as well. Um, 
Prof, here go. This is sorry. Is is, is that finished? Hmm. The conversation finished. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I've been hoping that maybe the prof will say the LPC will intervene on behalf of the candidate. Um, the, the problem is to what extent can the LPC intervene? Because the LPC is not able to, f because the thing is, you need to finish your articles, right? So the LPC won't be able to intervene in the sense of finding you another articles of clerkship or whatever the case might be. In that specific instance, um, you know, if it's within a firm, you'll have to cede to another attorney that's also practicing in the relevant firm. Um, but it is, uh, unfortunately, I don't think that is within the mandate of the LPC. Um, um, you know, it is the, the, the candidate will have to to, to look for for for, for another um, attorney that can, can can take over that 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 um, to, to act as principal and also it will be have to, it will have to be something that you will also have to mention in your in your um, in your admission papers. Hello. Um, let me just quickly see. I see there's a Cabello that's had his hand up for quite some time. Cabello, do you quickly want to ask your question? Hi. Is it Cabello? No. Where can we find the assessments on the platform? I Is don't. Uh, assessments in terms of previous assessments for the subjects that's been written? No, the current assignments that we need to submit. The, the current assignments or previous assignments? Current. The current ones, you'll have to ask Sukiswa uh, uh, in relation to where the assignments is and how you can access them. Yeah, we cannot find them on the platform, but also, uh, uh, is it possible to get a, a soft copy of the study guide? To get a? Soft copy of the study guide for the study guide to be uploaded as well. I do not think so. I don't think uh, there's soft copies available to, to distribution to students. Um, again, you'll have to confirm that with 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 the Zuki as well. Thank you. Okay, perfect. I'm just uh, uh, quickly going down the the list. Uh, Cabello, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Okay, Cabello, go ahead. Uh, it's in relation to the contingency fee. Yes. Um, if I'm wrong, I had. You saying that it um you are only entitled to your fees once you have succeeded with your case. Um, in, I will make a, an example in the case of maybe medical negligence, where you are not successful with the case. However, um, they have um awarded you the cost orders to say that you can recover the cost. So in that case, um, who are the costs supposed to Go to are they going to the attorney or the client? That will be towards. So if you if you the case has now been heard in front of the court or whether it's the medical negligence or whatever the case might be, yeah. uh, and the you are unsuccessful as I've indicated uh, in the slides, and you'll find it in a nurse as well. Um, obviously, the client will be uh, uh, will be responsible for the party to party costs, and that is also something obviously that needs to be in your fees agreement, and that your client should be made aware of. That even though it's contingency successful basis, you still run that risk of being held liable for party to party costs. No, no, where you are, are, are awarded the 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 cost or the in your favor. As in your favor, yes. So who did, did they cover your fees only or you or you just have to um, pay the client also because at that point. Oh, yes, yeah. no. So it covers your fees. Uh, uh, so as I've mentioned, so it covers your 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 fees that you would normally charge and you for contingency fees. Also, it's called a success fee that can be an addition to the fee as well. So whatever the client gets then paid out uh, is then basically it covers your fee and the rest is paid out towards the client. All right, thank you so much. Okay, there's a Lawrence there with a question. Yeah, Prof, can I just ask a question here? I just want to check something here. 
Uh, well, I will take you a little bit back. I'm sorry to take you back. Uh, I just want to check in relation to uh, admission, if you do allow me. I just want to check one question. Yes. Uh, yes. In an event that uh, I am being rejected or not accepted by the court when I apply for admission, is there any other legal recourse? Or can I appeal the decision of the High Court? Because obviously, uh, courts, not, they are not also so much perfect. Um, uh, then they might make one or two mistakes. Can 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 I can I challenge their decision, or is it final? Yes, obviously you are able to challenge any court decision and to follow the relevant appeal route. But you'll find a lot of the times, in terms of um, well, this is just from recollection when I did my uh, articles of clerkship, and you you go to and register your contract and. Usually your papers are submitted to your uh, the relevant, uh, you know, a, a provincial um, law society as well. They also have a look at your papers and, and a lot of the times they'll say, oh, no, this is not correct. You'll need to amend your papers. You'll need to put in X, Y and Z uh, before it serves before the relevant court. So there is, a, you know, sort of there is advice in terms of what should be put in. Uh, you know, what will get the, the admission application, uh, you know, through the relevant courts. But yes, and it's 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 a good idea, obviously, to 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 get an advocate to if, if you're a bit a bit uncertain about this, uh, about your application, obviously, as well. Or there might be a bit of a tricky area there as well. It is a good idea to obviously, uh, you know, get a, a counsel uh, uh, or an advocate to move your application, which has got a bit of an experience, um, uh, you know, in moving these applications. And that also might have de dealt with a few difficult cases. So don't just uh, because usually we just, you know, you just you you know, advocate from for, from somewhere or a friend or whatever the case might be to move your admission application if it's not too complicated. But if you do foresee that there might be a few complications in relation to your admission, it's also advisable to, to get an advocate that's got some experience in moving these applications and that might be able to, to address any concerns that the presiding officer might have. Um, Ma'am, can I also ask in that, is it possible that you can be uh, registered for your articles and then be rejected when you have to be admitted. Because it's in that when they are registering your articles, they screen you and check everything that might be a problem. Now, obviously, you can be uh, rejected by the court as well. Uh, when they find that, for example, they might they might find that you're not fit and, a fit and proper person. Um, so that might be uh, the, the, one of the biggest reasons why you're rejected in terms of, of registering, registering. Or it might be that your papers is an absolute mess and that you don't uh, you don't you ha you haven't addressed everything that should be addressed in terms of of uh, the relevant regulations and in terms of the relevant legislation and in terms of that your application uh, to be admitted can be rejected. So it's an absolute possibility and it's had, it, it has happened before when, you're at, um, when you are uh, rejected in terms of being admitted. So a possibility and that's why it is so important to really pay attention to your admission papers, make sure that you get everything right, look at previous examples, um, if you know this, as I've just mentioned, if you know that there's going to be a difficult area to get somebody with experience to move your application and very important to make sure that you address everything that's into that's required of you in terms of the relevant legislation in your founding affidavit. Oh, okay. uh, Ma'am, just to help out here, there is a gentleman who asked if he can get a soft copy of a study guide. There is a study guide online uh, when you go to your landing page of, of LEAD. There is a study guide. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for providing the, that information. So it seems like there is a soft copy of the study guide available on um, on the website. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, um, I, will just, I will just post my number now. Uh, we have a WhatsApp group. I will just assist him. That's perfect. And thank you so much. And it's yes, it's important to help each other out. 
sometimes feels a bit distant if you're just uh, on the computer. So yes, that'll be absolutely great. Um, any other questions? Uh, that's I see. There's a, st uh, a couple of hands still up. There's a um, there's a Hotatsu Pakati. You've got a question. That's correct, Prof. I asked about the principal uh, if they get removed from the role. But oh, yes. just thank you. Uh, just to add on that one, who seeds your articles for you? Isn't it when you leave that particular principal and go to another firm, if they are still active, they seed your articles for you to the other attorney. But now that they are no longer there, who will sign your documents for you to be able to go to the uh, new attorney and finish off your articles? Yes. In relation to if that attorney just disappears, or whatever the case might be, I'm not too certain. Also, I mean, also relevant is, for example, if your principal passes away, um, you know, what happens then? But I'm sure that that is catered for in the relevant rules and regulations. So I would just advise you to, to go read them closely, what happens in the in the event that a principal is no longer available because of uh, whatever the circumstances might be. And surely there is uh, there has to be a rule or regulation that caters for for those instances as it might have it, it, it must have happened before. <laughs> Apologies. So just just make sure that you read the regulations and the rules closely in that regard. Is there any further questions? Um, if you don't have a question, you can just. Um, Prof, can I ask a question? <clears throat> Alphys, yes, you're welcome to. Um, sorry that I uh, interject. Uh, it also might be a little bit unrelated. Uh, if as a candidate attorney, um, you are finally admitted. Uh, you set up your own firm uh, and let's say business is not so good and your previous principal suggests that you work with them. Uh, is it possible you could uh, contract or freelance to the your, your principal and uh, still have your own firm uh, when you get your, you know, when and if you, or as you get clients? Uh I'm actually uh, not too sure if that would be permissible. Remember that whenever you change your details, whether you're practicing as an individual and you decide to move to another firm or whatever the case might be, you need to inform the relevant LPC, uh, you know, there's certain, you know, you, and um, the LPC of, of, of where you're practicing, when you're practicing and for which accounts you're practicing. So I'm not too sure whether it would be allowed in that respect, but obviously you're able to move freely from one firm to the other in terms of that. But but obviously your details are, always needs to be updated in terms of uh, in terms of the the records that they keep at, to, at the LPC. I'm not too sure if you're able to 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 work uh, for your own name and then to 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 work for a firm if if if, if that is sort of what you're you're meaning. But I'm sure that just read the regulations and the rules closely yeah. in that regard. But I do know that if you change firms or, uh, for example, if you're, if you're practicing on your own and you decide to join a firm, that obviously that is something that you need to, though your relevant details needs to change in relation to, to what is kept um, with the LPC. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Um, there's still a couple of hands. Uh, there's a Precious, do you have a question? Uh, Prof, I just want to check in relation to a, a fidelity fund. Yes. My understanding for the fund is that it covers, uh, it works like insurance, if I'm not mistaken. In yes, an event does. that money gets stolen or Maybe there's an issue of fraud committed by the attorney or or his or her staff. Now I I read that the, uh, they are covered up to 1.5 million rand, if I'm not mistaken. Now I just want to check. I, I know of a case uh, in a in attorney is defrauding people over eight million. So if then they are covered over a period of a year, over each year then they are covered for uh, about 1.5 million. So what happens uh, to to the other 6.5 million? Uh, what will what will happen? 
uh, with those people who are owed such money in excess of 1.5 million. Yes. So as I've mentioned uh, in, in, in the slides as well, and you'll find it in a guide as well. So if obviously there, there's a certain amount that's going to be paid out by the Fidelity Fund, and a lot of firms have got extra extra insurance cover um, for in in the case you know obviously with 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 uh, with outside insurers if if uh, in the event that something like that might happen your big firms etc. But unfortunately, if there is um, if there is no extra insurance that uh, that is available, it means that um, the client loses that money, and and that is the unfortunate uh, reality of it. So, the Fidelity Fund is able to assist to some extent, but uh, as I've mentioned, a lot of firms do have extra cover. Obviously, the bigger firms would have extra insurance cover uh, for for clients in the event that something like that might happen. Um, but yes, so. That is the unfortunate side of it. Uh, otherwise, if, if, if there's a cap on what the Fidelity Fund pays out, then obviously um, if, the, if that cap has been reached, um, then the rest of the money is is, is just, uh, you know, uh, is, 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 is not retrieved and, and not retrievable. Unless you obviously you're able to, uh, you know, go after the relevant attorney uh, uh, in his or her uh, personal capacity obviously, and try and retrieve the, the funds directly from that relevant individual, which is also obviously a possibility. Thank you, Professor um, Kavat. It's a pleasure. Uh, any further questions for tonight? Let's maybe, um, yes. Uh, um, um, prof, my, mine is not a question, man. Um, I heard a gentleman, uh, one gentleman spoke about a, a WhatsApp group uh, I'm not sure if he's listening. Maybe he could just guide us as to how we uh, drop our number so that we can be uh, part of the WhatsApp group as well. If there's anybody that's able, or the uh, the administrator of the WhatsApp group, if you're able to maybe just um, provide some insight there for the other students on the WhatsApp group in the chat box, that would be great. Um, so that everybody is, um, you know, part of, of. Just leave it on the chat. Yes, just leave, leave it on the chat. That's what we did when we started. Yeah. Yes. So leave your number on the chat, um, so that you're able to 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 uh, to be added to the group. Is there any other questions? Is everybody otherwise happy? Um, ma'am, question, yes. ma'am. Please yes. don't forget the slides. Yes. No, I am actually going to move from my chair unless I've sent today's slides and tomorrow's. So Zukiswa can check her first thing tomorrow morning in an inbox. The slides are going to be there and you'll be able to get them. And from the previous days, please. Yes. So the ethical the ethical slides are all in one. So it's about 30 slides, which covers yesterday's and today's. And then obviously CLP uh, is also a set of slides. Um, that um, I'll make available, so you'll you'll have them by tomorrow. Um, she will be able to send them out to you. Thank you. Mm. No ma problem. I, like I think, ma'am, about... I think... Hello? Hello? Yes. I'd like to ask about bond cancellation attorneys. How do they become um, in that profession? Are they uh, law firms that are appointed by banks? How does that work? That deals with bond cancellations. Are you, yes, talking about, are, are you talking about a conveyancer or if you just cancel bonds? Uh, a conveyancer that works with the bank, because I know they are dedicated uh, bond cancellation attorneys. So I'm wondering if are they appointed by the bank? How do you, is it a law firm that is appointed by the bank? I, I don't understand how that works. And you are asking me a question of which I know nothing about. My my knowledge of conveyancing and conveyancing practice is rather or is is, is rather not too up to date. So if anybody knows, uh, but bond cancellation, uh, they would. I my feeling is that they would obviously be an attorney or oh, conveyances that specialises it, who the bank then um, obviously. Um, instructs to cancel the relevant bonds. So obviously, I don't think um, the relevant banks would have their own in-house personnel. They obviously would be instructing a relevant firm 
with uh, the relevant conveyances in terms of, um, you know, cancelling the bonds. So that is, I think, how it works. Um, the the banks uh, do have firms that they make use of to, to, to provide those services to them. All right, thank you. Have to get onto a panel uh, with the banks. So it's a very hard process because the banks obviously have their favourites, but they appoint attorneys and then they put them on a panel and then they allocate work on the panel. Yes, there you go. I All think right. uh, I think that's work, and that is also also uh, the unfortunate side of the attorney's profession is 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 kickbacks. So if you're able to provide some money to an official at the bank to get you on that list and to get you at the top of the list, obviously you'll be the firm that gets that money. And it works the same with um, with realtors and 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 you know being provided with with the conveyancing work. It's all about being paid kickbacks. But uh, you know if you're caught doing that, um, it is. Uh, uh, you will be removed from the role for 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 dishonesty in that regard. All right, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Any further questions? I think I still see a yellow hand. Cabello, Alphys, your hands are still up. I think I've already spoken to both of you, and I think you. Um, it might just be by mistake that your hands are up. Uh, it's just about 20 quarter to eight. So we're, we are a bit early tonight. Um, thank you so much for attending the class. I know it's very, is there still a question? I know it's very tiring for everybody to, to, to have to attend these classes in the evening. And I've got loads of respect uh, for all of you that is doing this course. Um, I know it takes a lot of time and a, a lot of time away from, from your families. So good luck with uh, with ethics and I will meet you tomorrow for CLP and I will make sure that I send those slides as we speak. Um, if there's no further questions, have a very good evening and I'll see you guys all tomorrow again. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. -bye. Everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night to you all. Good night, all. Good night. Bye. 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 Night, 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 night. Colleagues. Uh, is anyone who want to please assist us? We have provided the numbers. Please add us, uh, Mr. Onosa. Okay, colleagues. Uh, is there anyone who want to assist us in navigating the assignments? A link has been provided in the chat for you to join the WhatsApp group. WhatsApp <laughs> group. On the chat, and you're going to be edited. The link for the assignment. Yes. The link is for the WhatsApp group. Where to find it? In the chat.
Okay, okay, thank you. I've found them. Yes, I've joined the group. Thank you so much. Pleasure.